Good morning. Um, yes, welcome to the first morning in Vegas, which is always interesting. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for getting up and uh, joining us this morning. We, we have a great day today, obviously, starting with a, a panel. I'm a uh, general session I'm really excited about, the winning formula for women candidates. Great panelists, and they're going to talk about uh, their awesome experience and, and their knowledge of the issue. So um, folks will, will in here will be the ones that uh, I tell all my uh, female candidates to hire instead of the deadbeats who are still sleeping because they were out too late last night. So um, just remember that. I remember, I have a long memory. Um, my partner Brett will tell you that. And then, um, but well, welcome this morning. Uh, very excited for the day. We'll have obviously a general session. Then um, there are breakouts right after this, um, as well as a lunch session, and then caucuses in the afternoon. And um, strongly, strongly encourage folks to come to the Hall of Fame and Campaign Excellence Ceremony, just really honoring the great work that was done last year, but also honoring uh, the folks who are um, being admitted to the Hall of Fame. It's always a, a great ceremony and, and, and good to look back at some of, some of the accomplishments of people who've really led the way in the past. So I uh, hope everyone has a great day. We're going to start it off in an awesome way this morning. So I'm going to invite the panelists uh, to come up now. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you um, for coming up here. So we are talking about the winning formula for women candidates. And so I'm going to allow um, the folks on the panel to introduce themselves and um, let you know about a little bit more about them and why they are actually sitting in front of you this morning. Um, my name is Mike Yusefi. I work for a group called Winning for Women. Um, I started out my career uh, political career on, on the official side, very quickly realized that was not for me. Never have regretted making the jump to the political side of things. Um, went over to the House Republican campaign arm, the NRCC, and was involved in starting their women's engagement efforts there. And then in the, I guess, uh, let's see, 16 cycle, started consulting a little bit more on my own. In 17, I ran, um, I think one of the more notable um, to this conversation races that I worked on there was Karen Handel's special election in Georgia in 17. And then um, went over to Winning for Women to help launch this effort. Um, it's a group dedicated to seeing more women seated federally. We're just focused on federal races right now, and we provide support, both hard and soft dollar support uh, for federal women candidates. Awesome. Well, we have the Georgia connection. Um, so my name is Shelby Dantic. Uh, I started my career at Conservation Voters. I worked for candidates up and down the ballot from city council to Congress, including a lot of women um, conservationists. Um, in 2018, I was Senator Tester's deputy campaign manager, but notably for this conversation last cycle, I was um, Congresswoman Carolyn Bordeaux's campaign manager in Georgia's 7th Congressional District, which is the northeastern suburbs of Atlanta. Um, it was the only Democrat to to Repu Republican to Democratic flip last cycle um, at the congressional level. So really excited for this conversation. It's very sweet. Hi, I'm Sam O. At, I'm a VP at Targeted Victory. Um, I help lead the general consulting division at the firm. Uh, I previously was a chief of staff in the California State Assembly, a chief of staff on the Hill to a member from uh, California. Um, I currently uh, uh, am a general consultant to uh, Senator Tim Scott, and I helped uh, run the campaigns for Congresswoman Michelle Steele and Young Kim last cycle. Thank you. Uh, well, my name is Celinda Lake. I'm delighted to be part of this panel. And I saw out there in the audience two rows that I really want to acknowledge. It's wonderful to have a woman leader in this organization that's also committed to women. And we worked a long, long time ago on a number of women campaigns. Um, our firm is Lake Research Partners, and uh, we have worked for more women in Congress than any other firm in the country, and also a lot of firsts and a lot of women of color. And I'm really honored to be um, here with this panel. I'd, 
And for eight o'clock in the morning, I would go anywhere for Larry. I admire him so much. And then it's great to see both the Republican and the Democratic women and men on this panel because um, the Republicans had really lagged behind. And I'll tell you, one of the things that was really formidable in 2020 was the very good Republican uh, women's campaigns that were run. And they took back two, the um, two thirds of the house, uh, seats that they won in Congress, they run with women. So uh, we won in 2018 with women, they won in 2020 with women, and game on for 2022. I bet we'll have a record number of women, women races. So delighted to be here. All right, let's get into it. I think Selinda's gonna start with, um, to level set the conversation with some research that she's done, uh, which is fascinating. Then we'll have the panelists uh, respond to, to, to the slides. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, what we want to share with you is just a little tapas to set the table, as we said, and... Uh, Hold on a second, Selena, can we get below the slides? These are from, I'll just introduce them while we're loading them. These are from the Barbara Lee Family Foundation, which has done a tremendous amount of research, more research than anyone else in the country, uh, bipartisan and particularly focusing on women of color as well as white women and looking at women as executive leaders. But I think there are a lot of lessons in this research for uh, women up and down the ticket. Are we able to load the signs? So then why don't you just go into it a little bit and just yeah. the contours so, and then, uh, we'll and then we, can, uh, we can run through them later and we can also uh, send them to you. So the first point uh, in terms of uh, women candidates is that they have to prove that they're qualified. And in fact, we just completed some research on how do women get reelected because happily now we have enough women that we can look at reelection as well as election. And what was really, really interesting is even if you were a, an incumbent, you had to prove that you were qualified. Men were assumed to be qualified. Uh, women had to prove that they were qualified. And God bless the voters, gotta love them. Uh, they readily acknowledge that it is harder for women, even as they participate in making it harder for women. And as you know, voters ha often have mutually contradictory views and deeply resent having it pointed out to them. So this isn't going to be a winning strategy to say you're making it harder for women. But women have to prove that they're qualified. If we look at the next slide, uh, women ha uh, voters are perfectly willing to elect a man that they think is qualified and don't like, but they are not willing to elect a woman that they don't like, uh, even if they think she is qualified. So women are constantly juggling this likability and qualification uh, kind of criteria. And one of the things that's uh, uh, really hard about this is it's really hard in today's campaigns to maintain likability. Um, and it's easy to prove you're qualified, but it's hard to maintain likability. Voters also notice women's mistakes more than they do men. They tend to remember them a little bit more because remember, they were on shaky foundation. They were always wondering, well, is she qualified? And they hate it when any candidate right now um, uh, makes excuses for their mistakes rather than just taking responsibility. So there are a lot of double binds for women candidates out there, but maintaining your likability and your effectiveness at the same time is certainly one of them. The good news is, if we look at the next slide, uh, is that many of the things that make you likable also make you appear qualified uh, to voters. And voters um, like very much uh, personal background, <clears throat> accomplishments, listening to people, fighting on behalf of uh, people or overcoming barriers. Overcoming barriers actually testing better than fighting right now. Small business, advocacy, although advocacy is interesting and this will be amusing to our, our panel up here. Democrats love advocacy. Republicans are like, what's advocacy? What's a community leader? I want a small business owner. Um, bringing funding to her community, taking tough questions from a reporter, serving in a variety of offices. If we look at the next slide, uh, you can see here that there's also a big gender gap when it comes to women. Uh, and um, uh, women tend to favor women candidates, men tend to favor male candidates. And so that's a little bit different challenge because of course Republicans favor uh, male candidates and Democrats favor women candidates. So often a strategy includes holding on or protecting against affecting women 
when you're running against a Republican woman, but the flip side is getting some of those women when you're uh, a Republican woman, and I think it'll be interesting to talk through those strategies. That gender gap is true even with millennials. Millennials pride themselves on being gender neutral. Would that it were true. Um, voters pride themselves on lots of things they're not. <laughs> but uh, there's a very big gender gap among millennials as well. So talking about uh, the gender gap when it comes to uh, candidates, one of our secret tricks in polling, and we use this for race as well as gender, is to uh, ask people how their friends and family would vote rather than how they would vote, because they always upgrade themselves. They're great voters, but either people need new friends and family, uh, which is gonna be hard to accomplish by 2022, or people are a lot more honest about how their friends and family are um, voting. And finally, we just completed some work about how in the COVID era, if we look at the next slide, do women present themselves, and how does it differ by race? And that's another thing, uh, one of the things that's really powerful right now is that the Republicans are nominating women of color too. We don't have a monopoly on it. And you only need to look at the uh, lieutenant governor's race, and several of us I know are involved in that race in uh, Virginia to see two women of color running against each other in a really rock em and sock em race. But for white and African American women governors, people wanted to know what they had accomplished. For Asian American Pacific Islanders, they wanted to know what she and her team had accomplished. Interestingly, there's a lot of prejudice against Asian American candidates right now, and Asian American women are really having a tough time. They're very electable and electable in both parties, but it is different. Latinas, they wanted to know what her goal was, whether she had made progress, and what her economic progress was. Latinas had the hardest time proving that they actually had an economic plan. And for everyone, they were less interested in the bill signing ceremony and more interested in being out in the community, listening and getting things done. That's the winning formula for women and frankly for men too right now, listening and getting things done. So let me turn it back to Larry. Great, thank you. That was fascinating data. And I want to pass it off to other members of the panel to get your reaction. Um, agree or disagree? Why don't you, Mike? Sure. So I feel like a lot of this focused on gubernatorials, which isn't, you know, I'm a little bit more, um, what I work on is largely federal, but a few, a few things definitely rang true through that. Um, particularly, you know, your, the slide, I don't know if we have the ability to go back a few slides, but um, maybe three slides back, you had mentioned um, uh, that women candidates have to balance, yeah, maybe back one more right there down on the bottom left. There are more opportunities for women candidates to showcase their likability than their qualifications. And we've done some internal research and work as well, just looking at how candidates, both primary and general, obviously totally different beasts, navigate races. And something super interesting we found, you know, to make sure we were doing it thoroughly, we kind of divided it by um, buckets of types of districts. You've got, you know, red, blue, purplish districts, and then profiles of candidates. And so for the sake of this discussion, you know, I'll call one profile of a woman candidate the resume candidate, and we'll call another one the narrative candidate. And the resume candidate is your kind of like bullet points. This is why I'm qualified to run. And then the narrative candidate would be a little bit more like, um, my, my daughter's friend died of an opioid overdose. I'm very passionate about this. This is why I'm running, right? There's a story behind it. And across the board, those narrative candidates, they, they pulled closely together, but across the board, whatever issue we were testing, the narrative candidate performed better because they told you a little bit more about their why, et cetera, but then they had to go into why they were equipped to address it. So that one particularly jumped out um, as something that I've seen both in our data and for the candidates we've worked with federally. And Shelby, I know you have some thoughts on that storytelling and, and that authenticity piece. Yeah, I think that, and I'm interested to hear Celinda's um, take as a pollster on this, but um, I think we often frame candidates in a different way than men, um, sort of to what Micah was saying, um, you know, a mom, a, a small business owner, whereas we wouldn't necessarily say a father, a small business owner. Um, and so framing it um, sort of story front narrative first, um, I think can, can be very effective in helping women candidates, but it's also, um, I think the flip is true on uh, making sure that we're framing it authentically to them and not just having it be fully about the narrative. 
Can you be specific on that? Like, let's talk about your most recent race, the Boudreaux race. Like, how did you frame it? What, you know, what were you all thinking? And then what you ended up presenting? Like, what were you balancing and then end up presenting at, you know, to the voters? Yeah. Um, so Congresswoman Bordeaux is a public policy professor, um, has her PhD. Um, certainly we were still leading with mom. Um, and I think that that um, you know, showed a different side to voters, but I will say, um, and, and Selinda mentioned this too, I think one of our most powerful ads that we ran last cycle, um, it started off with Carolyn just saying, I'll be your advocate, um, and, and showing them, you know, what she could accomplish on their, on their behalf was, was sort of the narrative that she was building um, as an effective advocate for them in Congress. Could I add something really quickly? Sure. I think, um, um, so fast forwarding to when women are elected, we know that they are legislatively, the data shows they're more effective. They, they pass two times as much legislation. They bring home more at the federal level, more federal money home to their district. I think it's like around 10% more to serve their constituents. Um, and I think there's, there is a, a final piece that has kind of been falling into place over the last few cycles, which is then telling that story back home or turning it into political capital for, for lack of a better word because you can be doing all of that and then have a totally different narrative happening at home where, where the constituents don't know that. And I feel like the last few cycles, that, that piece has fallen into place a lot more. And that's a little bit more incumbent rele relevant, but I wanted to add that. Sam, you want to jump in? Uh, you have an interesting dynamic where you lost a tough race in 18 and you come back in, in 2020. So, you know, what about this research from Selinda? Did it apply? What were you thinking about as you transitioned from one race to the next? And, and, and where you, you know, what are the things you felt made a difference? Uh, beyond sort of the macro environment, obviously that's part of it, but what did you do as a campaign? Because you want to take credit, right? So tell us about that. Um, I, I think one of the things is the, the electorate has changed quite a bit over the years as well, right? So, you know, it's more diverse, it's younger, um, and uh, for a lot of different reasons, probably including like a, a you know, a motor voter or like uh, mail, all male ballot states or what have you. But I think um, because of that, I, I think there was a huge uh, uh, narrative, what in 2018, uh, with the rise of suburban um, mothers, right? So I, I think, and now it's, there's a lot of talk about the rise of Asian voters or, or Latino voters, right? So I think, um, because the electorate's a lot different, the way we talk about our candidates have changed quite a bit over the last several cycles. And, you know, I remember when, uh, uh, you know, I was chief of staff to Congresswoman uh, Mimi Walters, and when she ran for Congress in, I guess it was 2014, um, a, a lot of the, you know, messaging centered around her experience. She served in the state assembly. She served in the state uh, senate. She, uh, she's going to continue that type of leadership in Congress. And in... 18 and 20, we kind of shifted away from talking about, uh, you, you know, uh, experience and record and talk more about like per personal story. And that's something the panel has touched on quite a bit. If you look, look at down the chart, it even says served in the state legislature, which um, I think, you know, we saw a lot more of like 10 years ago. But yeah, I mean, what, some of the ads we were running for Young Kim, for example, it literally just said immigrant, female, conservative. And it was some of the best creative we ran all cycle. We ran it for 12 months at one point. Um, my firm also works with uh, Senator Joni Ernst. I know we were running creative that said uh, uh, mother, soldier, leader, right? So it really just, you know, the way we talk about the candidates have changed and it's pro probably like somewhat due to, you know, how the electorate's changed over the years as well, so. Great, um, for folks, could you put up the slides um, that tells people how to send in questions, the Slido one, thank you. So folks, I encourage the audience to send in questions and uh, hopefully they make the cut and I get to decide that. But um, please send in uh, the questions. Uh, once they put it up, you go to slido.com and they'll give you the code hopefully on that screen. Uh, awesome. So let's move on. One of the things I find super interesting, right, is we've been talking about just probably in our minds, the general election and, and just winning the ultimate race. But there are real dynamics in primaries as well, um, as, you know, especially on the Democratic side you saw in 2018. I don't think Emily's list had a great primary cycle. She, they just kept busting out and winning, you know, long shot, 
you know, front runner. They kept winning and winning and winning. And so the dynamics in a primary, you know, how are they different in the general? And I'm curious about that on the Republican side too. It's like, what are the thoughts you're thinking? How do you run in the primary? And then sometimes what do you have to pivot to in the general to be successful? And, and, and how do you make that pivot successful? Because sometimes they're, they're big pivots sometimes. So I, I, I open the floor to anyone who wants to jump in on that. I'll, I'll lead off. I think um, sticking with this kind of resume v story sort of um, way to present yourself or, or platform to present yourself, I, I do think Republicans were a little bit slower to get on that train. Like I think of um, really, really great female ads. Or think of the Doors ad. That was a very, very popular one. Um, maybe 18, I don't remember exactly what year that was, I think in 18, where it told this compelling story about this woman, she was a veteran, all this, but it told it in this very compelling narrative um, and very visually um, appealing sort of way. And I do think a lot of times in primaries, Republicans, if they could, their ideal ad is like literally a resume. And then I did this, and then I did this, and then I did this. All important things to know, but I think that <clears throat> particularly knowing that women do better presenting themselves um, through that more narrative, uh, I guess, uh, platform, then um, I think that shift has made a big difference. And I think we saw that in 20, both in, in the ads that were run, but also in the amount of, of Republican women making it through primaries. And, and very red primaries, I'd add, too. There was a lot of really red states that nominated Republican women. Another thing about primaries is that, um, you know, it's important to step back and, and understand the different structures of the primaries. Um, so the average Democratic primary, particularly if a woman is running, because you're going to see higher turnout, about 56, 59 percent women. Um, it's also going to have a very substantial liberal base. If there are people of color, it's going to have a substantial African-American base. These are three of the groups of people. Uh, college educated women that vote the most for women candidates. The flip side is, and please uh, amplify this, but the average Republican primary is 45% female. The biggest block is evangelical voters, one of the hardest groups for women candidates to get. I think what was interesting is, uh, you know, in 2018, women had a tremendous advantage getting through Democratic primaries. Uh, net, well, Republican women couldn't make it through the primaries. Now through a variety of tactics, and I wouldn't presume to talk about them, but women are emerging out of Republican primaries. And we've also discovered, much to our chagrin perhaps for some of us, is, is uh, there are some very conservative women out there. Uh, so you don't have to nominate a man to get a conservative uh, or a Trump supporter um, uh, or a gun supporter or someone who can shoot a gun, uh, whether in the military or in a pickup truck. So uh, there are a lot. Uh, I, I think that's changing. But the structure of the primaries really favor Democratic women. And then the other thing that we find is that um, now I think the challenge, and the challenge for 2022 is going to be, there's no longer just one woman, at least on the Democratic side, there's no longer just one woman who's going to be in a race. Uh, there are multiple women candidates, and we haven't had a lot of experience uh, running women against women. But there are a lot of stereotypes about that, like the traditional stereotype of the cat fight, quote unquote. Uh, and even in a general election, um, sometimes the Democratic women, uh, Democratic uh, general election voters only, are some of the highest defecting women candidates. So um, Lisa Murkowski was basically reelected after she was beat in her primary, ran as an independent, then elected with uh, the votes of Democratic women who did not have primary vote history. So there's a lot of uh, churning and challenging here in terms of it's a very fast changing environment, I think, where we're learning a lot on the fly. Uh, something quick to add. I don't want to feel like I'm talking way too much here. And the other thing I think that is um, maybe not the primary factor, but contributing is the main pick top three topics in, in left and, and right um, primary, respectively. Um, think of Republican primary, how important you know law and order conversations are. And if you just take the primary out of it, just poll where women fall on those issues, they, they have to do a lot more work to, to demonstrate that they are competent and strong and assertive on those issues. So I think that also plays into, into that. 
No, that, that's great. And Sam or Shelby, jump in on any of this? Yeah, I think, you know, one thing as far as flipping from a primary to a general, um, reflecting on both, you know, the George race and other races um, would be the validators that you emphasize. And so, you know, pre-primary, uh, we were honored to have the endorsement of Congressman John Lewis. Obviously, we we rode that through the through the general election. But I think, you know, in particular, I think of some Montana races um, where those there are tough, tough general elections and, and your outside validator, right, is an angler, um, usually a man. Um, and, and so basically my, my rule of thumb and, and advice to candidates often on this is, is you want your validators to mirror your electorate. Um, and so whether it, it is that like the male permission structure or, um, you know, whatever archetype you're, you're going for there. But I think that that's um, an effective way to come at, you know, who you're, who you're highlighting on your campaign team. Great. Sam? Yeah, I, I would just take a maybe slightly different angle to uh, answer this question. Um, I, I think one of the biggest differences in, you know, Republican primaries and the success of women, uh, Republican women candidates now is also like they have resources that they didn't have 10, 20 years ago, right? So I think uh, digital fundraising has allowed women who, you know, maybe didn't have the professional network 20 years ago to raise like, you know, hard dollars for a campaign where, you know, a, a, a unique, interesting, personal story can help you raise that money now online, right? So, so you're not willing, uh, willing the major donor necessarily as a you know first-time female candidate in politics, new to politics. Um, it's not about having that relationship with that major do donor for 20 years because you're a state assembly woman or whatever it may be. It's you're able to fund a real campaign, and then you can talk about how conservative or liberal you are, and you're. Your, your qualifications for running for office, right? So I think that's been a major turning point for, um, you know, how primary elections are won and the success and of uh, a lot of female candidates on both sides, frankly. I mean, you see it with uh, Katie Porter on the D Democrat side. She's a fantastic small dollar uh, fundraiser. You, you see it with Young Kim. Young Kim um, raised uh, I think it was $3.1 million in contributions under $200 last cycle versus her opponent who only raised 500000 So I think um, that, you know, that really changes the dynamics of a primary election when you actually have resources that um, you can actually talk about, you know, how conservative or liberal you are, and you can, talk, you can have surrogates talking about you know, why you're the best candidate, why you, you should move on to the general election. And then I think also it's the evolution of like outside groups uh, winning for women. They do a, a fantastic job help guiding female candidates in primaries and then getting involved. And like we, we see a lot more uh, groups, uh, outside group efforts too, to help uh, women get elected and uh, in, in out of primary, so. Yeah, and I love the fundraising angle because it's important, right? I mean, access, <coughs> for uh, candidates from sort of the non, quote unquote, non-traditional background has often been a hurdle from a fundraising perspective. Do you think on the Republican side, I have my hypotheses, but my hypothesis is a little bit, I saw all these women on the Democratic side win, get through their primaries and win, and part of the Republican activist base, the small donor side, hey, we've got women on our side too, who we think should be lifted up, and it became like a point of pride thing, and so you can drive the activist fundraising from that perspective. Do you feel like that was you know a, a shift in in the activist base, or was it just no? I'm going to beat Harley Ruda, or I'm going to you know, what do you think drove that change in fundraising and that opportunity for women? Um, I, I think it was a strategic decision. I, I mean, like, California is a very expensive uh, place to run a campaign, and we're in the LA media market. So, you, you know, from a strategic standpoint, we had to kind of um, make early investments and, like, make that a, like a focal point of, like, how we were going to win these races. Um, you know, uh, a Republican candidate had not been an incumbent Democrat member of Congress in a general election in 26 years. So, like, we kind of had this, like, idea that we had to operate differently or, you know, the same thing would happen over and over again. So I think, you know, um, making that early investment and like kind of taking that, I guess it seemed like a risk at the time, but you know, now I would, it's kind of funny to even think of it was a risk, but like uh, to, you know, engage with those folks, uh, you know, see what we can uh, 
doing the digital front. I think that was like a huge uh, uh, shift. And I and like the cool thing is, like, you know, we're seeing it now being done all over the place, right? It's it's almost like standard operating procedure for a camp, a, a big campaign nowadays. So, um, I want to bring up just the. Do you feel like um, for women candidates, are you, are you sort of looking for say? an open seat opportunity more than versus trying to go in after an incumbent is that you know what are the do you see a difference in opportunity in that would you if you're trying to get a woman actually elected are you looking for a certain type of race um, to give them a better chance Just, and I'm like oh, you, you brought this up yeah uh, so I, I remember seeing I want to say it was uh, Columbia, Columbia University did some research um, so these are ballpark numbers I don't have them fixed firmly in my head but um, when so male challengers run, female challengers run, men are more likely to win by something wild, like 300%, like hundreds and hundreds of times more likely to win. That's in challenger races. If you go to open races, that number drops dramatically down to like 25%, more likely a male candidate will win. If you go to incumbent races, it's about even um, male, female incumbents. And so, so first I would say, yeah, for a female candidate, odds are dramatically better in open seats, but we are seeing that change. You know, that data, I, I've been saying it for a little while now, so I know it's at least, that was from last cycle. So I bet even this past cycle, there was a lot, at least on the Republican side, um, 11 of the 15 flips in the house right. were by Republican women. So I'm sure that that number is skewing, you know, a little bit, you know, getting better from challenger to open, but it, no question open seats are a better um, opportunity for women candidates. Yeah, one of the things I would say, uh, and, and um, I, I totally agree with you on these studies that we've seen, there's uh, one little niche where uh, usually you're looking for an open seat for sure, and, and a lot of incumbents come back, but I will say those folks on our side uh, who are taking on primaries, against long-term incumbents, both male and female, they have been more successful running women candidates. So in Democratic primaries, where the primary is the fight, where you're not going on to a, a general particular, or a, you know, it's a very Democratic seat, you've seen younger candidates, candidates of color, women candidates, and often women of color, uh, and AOC, who's our client, is a great example of that being able to mobilize new voters into the electorate, uh, being able to combine that, uh, this formula of listening and getting things done. The listening part is um, uh, something that women really have an advantage on. And one of the things we've been doing, we've been testing collages of images of candidates. And uh, we put in that one picture where the woman is clearly the leader, but she is listening, she's not talking. And voters invariably right now are picking out that picture and saying, oh, I love that. You never see that. You never see a man do that. Um, and so uh, there's a really, I think there's one uh, in that general pattern on the Democratic side, and I, I don't know your side as well, in Democratic districts where the incumbent is a long-term male or female, you're seeing groups like Working Families, Parties, Justice Stems, et cetera, running women and women of color and being quite successful with it. Great. Um, let's, I want to move on to, um, I love attack ads. So I want to talk about attack ads. <laughs> and <laughs> um, I think you many contrast. of us. Contrast. Oh yeah, contrast. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, but I'm curious, a um, couple of different things. Um, from a general perspective, like, attacking women maybe in the past was a very different phenomenon now it seems to be like every it's open season so um so what are the types of attacks that you think are you know that are still resonant where you as an advisor are like oh that's our soft underbelly i don't i you know if they go there we're going to have some challenges because it feeds into whatever narratives and what are the types of attacks where you're like yeah come yeah, bring that on because we're just gonna, we can just pivot and you know punch you back really hard on it. So I'm just, um, and you can see I'm getting energized for the morning because this is this is an interesting topic for me. Um, but I would just throw it open, both either from direct experience or just research that you've seen. I think that probably an attack that we don't welcome, and I and I think Celinda already pointed this out in some data, um, probably mistakes and missteps. So pointing out any mistakes and I think particularly relevant would be like recent mistakes, mistakes from the campaign trail. 
um, as you know, a contrast where I think that hurts women much more than it hurts men. Um, I, I can't think of one that, I guess. Ones that immediately <laughs> what came to mind of ones that do not land. I think of um, Barbara Comstock, I, I think it was in 14. Oh, that's a good one. Um, she was running against a Republican woman running against a Democrat man, and he, I, I don't even remember the form that he said this, but he said she had never worked a day in her life, basically, or never held a real job, I think might have been the exact quote. And she was an attorney, had first off through Georgetown Law while raising kids, and worked at the Justice Department, and it, that just, that never went away the rest of the campaign, and she destroyed him in that election. And so, as I think of ones that are like, well, if you're going to do it, that's the one I'm not scared of, like, the kind of personal, um, um, just, just super low ball, no substance, just was an easy kind of low ball hit. In the Barbara Lee work, uh, we just did a, a whole study on negative campaigns, and uh, I'd be really interested in all of your opinion on this too, because um, a lo you're so right, Larry. I mean, there was a time when uh, it was, you know, uh, it was so hard to attack a woman. Now it's like voters are so over that. <laughs> They're like, you got into the arena, honey. You're fair game. Um, but uh, the who delivers the attack is also pretty important. And I think that there are some nuances there about who's delivering it and what the role of the woman is in delivering the ad. The other ad that used to work really uh, that I was nervous about, it's a variant of the mistake ad, and that is the ethics violation. Um, and it's still a little tougher on women, although good news, bad news. Bad news is that women are not perceived to be any more ethical than the men right now. Uh, so good news is the attacks don't matter that much more than they do for the men. Um, there is also an interaction between race and gender. And so one of the things we found in the most recent research that we did was that Latinas and Asian American Pacific Islander women, when they were attacked for ethics violations that were nepotism, and this would probably be true for men too, I don't know, we were only testing the women, uh, they were hit extra hard because voters, particularly white voters, had a stereotype that, yeah, I would expect that from a Latina, or a Latino, I think, too. Uh, yes, I expect that in the Asian American community. So there are interactions here, too, and we're talking about gender, but I think all of us know that there are a lot of basics to campaigns that have nothing to do with gender. This, these are differences at the margins. Let me take a different um, tact on that. Um, you know, and, and Sam, I'm curious your thoughts. Like, what did you all do, say, in the Kim race to be ready and inoculate ahead of time to anticipate the attack. I'm certain I ran some attack ads against <laughs> young Kim, so, but I'm just, you know, not to give away the secrets, but I, I'm just curious, like, what, what well, work did you us. feel like you had to do and that you did do that you felt was successful? Because the attacks came and they were, there was a ton of money spent in these races and a lot of it on negative. So what was, what was the homework that you did ahead of time to really uh, inoculate her from that? Um, I, I think in the, uh, in that race in particular, I, I think it's unique in the sense that um, Young's favorables were just through the roof, um, even after she narrowly lost in 2018. We actually saw early polling in 2019 that had her fave unfave um, much better than the incumbent, uh, even though uh, they were in the most expensive uh, general election race in uh, 2018. Uh, her fave on fave was fantastic. It was very high with independence, and we actually saw that hold the entire uh, the entire 2020 race too. So even after they started, you know, dumping a ton of uh, money in uh, negative or contrast ads, as, uh, as some would call it, uh, um, we, you know, we we saw her image hold up very well. So I think it's I, I think that is largely to do with like her brand and um, how uh, her deep roots in the community, that it was able, it, it was able to withstand some of those negative ads. But um, I, I think, you know, we're kind of in a place in politics now where I don't know if there's a ton of inoculation you can do because you know those hits are coming. So you better hit first before they start hitting you. So that was kind of the, that was the kind of like mindset we had that like, fine, we're gonna set the record first. We're gonna make sure uh, our opponent's credibility is going to take a, um, it's going to take some hits before they start uh, lobbying uh, attacks against us. So, so establish your narrative, both your own brand, but then also try to establish their brand as uh, aggressively as possible because you know it's coming, right? Yeah, I mean, in, in, in a lot of these target races, it's a 
it's a almost like a race to the bottom, right? I mean, like it's you'll see you'll oftentimes see in a targeted congressional or whatever race that um, you know both candidates have a image that's upside down by the end, right? So. Um, Knowing that that was how it was going to probably play out, the amount of money it was going to, um, the races we're going to each spend, we just felt like, you know, in a, in a situation like that, I don't know that there was a lot we could do to inoculate ourselves, especially in a district that Biden won by 10 points. So. Well, I want to add, just add on to what you said, because we did one of the IEs in the contrast ads against you, and we were doing it <laughs> for Planned Parenthood. And we went in to do focus groups first, and I just want to underscore two things that you said that were so smart and so smart strategy. And it was like, holy shit, we had assumed this person wasn't very well known and wasn't very well liked. It was like, holy shit, she's like really well known and really well liked. And um, they were like pushing back hard on, no, 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 she's in our community. I don't believe she has these views. No, no, no. And even when we showed the record, it's like, no, 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 I see her, I know her. She's not like that. And you said another thing that I thought was really smart. I think we often run these ads where we do the bio first and we never come back to it. And actually, your, Kim was deeply rooted in the community. As you said, that's what our research showed do. And then you came back to it. And it really, really reinforced what people were already thinking. It was a very, very well done campaign. And uh, so I think that this notion of bringing back the women's bio at the end, and Shelby, you were right, you were saying this too about the Bordeaux race, uh, that it helps these women candidates, maybe even a little bit more frankly than the men. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I think you know, many of these lessons are similar, whether it's male or female, but the stakes seem to, what I hear a lot of it, it's like, yeah, so it's a, a certain question from the audience, shouldn't, you know, you're saying, oh, we, we bring up mother. Should we be narrative on, you know, on men and them being a father? Or is it just the issue of like what happens, like your susceptibility on you know, if you don't have narrative in women? It's not that you don't want narrative if you have a male candidate, but you know, is it just that the importance of it is a bit heightened for, for a female candidate versus male? So just referencing a question from the audience. I mean, I think that this goes to the inoculation question too, um, and we saw this in our own race, but um, you know, when they do land the attacks, which they will on your candidate, um, it helps you to have the, the narrative frame because they do feel like um, you know, they know them, they can relate to them, like you know, I have a daughter or I am a mother, um, I think is, is really helpful and, and might inoculate more against the attacks. Um, I don't know, do you think we're gonna start saying it more about men too? <laughs> I, does, but I guess my, my pushback is, as a father, it's like, well, not that I'd ever run, don't. <laughs> no, but if, if, doesn't that matter for my campaign too? And is it that, is it that much different from, a, from a, a, a woman's campaign versus a man's campaign from that perspective? And I'm playing devil's advocate, so yeah, I'm just... Yeah. I think similar to what you said very early on about being authentic. Um, and I, I just say that because I have in my head a conversation I just recently had with a candidate or soon, soon to be candidate who she's incredibly accomplished. She's first generation American, started a business at a very young age, um, you know, multilingual, just such a sharp candidate. She said she was feeling really bad that she wanted to mention her son a lot. And she said, does that detract from me? Like, he's such an important part of me and why I'm running, but like, doesn't it take away from like how credible I look? And I, I was like, no, that's, that's a, a big part of your why. So when you step up to that starting line before the bullets start flying, you should have that rock solid. But secondly, there's a whole, so the, there's people that of course that will identify with your business background, all that other stuff. But there's a huge group of people that will identify with that and understand on a, on a certain level. Like, so lean into that if that's something that's authentic to your brand. You know, it's not going to be to mine, but to her it was. Yeah, that, that's great. Authenticity in today's campaign environment seems to be pretty massive. Um, and what you mentioned about women is like if they, if they sniff that lack of authenticity, yeah. I think you can get hammered. Uh, in some ways, much more, right? And I think that's what I'm hearing a threat throughout. It's like you have to be a little bit more careful. So being true is just going to help you no matter what. I think the other thing about having children, uh, there were two other things I would say. Uh, I think that moms wait more uh, that the woman is a mom than dads wait that the dad is a dad. So that's part of the equation. But the other thing is having young children in particular 
Uh, not so much for legislative office, but for executive office can be a downturn too. And a lot of women governors have gotten into trouble when there's, you know, who's going to take care of the state? And the great irony, I love this, um, and you know you've arrived when things like this happen. So we're doing a focus groups on women governors, and we had a married lesbian woman governor, hypothetical, obviously, uh, although nice to see, would be nice to see. And there were mothers, uh, they were mothers of two young girls, and uh, the voters in the focus group said, this is perfect. If there's a crisis, one mom for the kids, one mom for the state. <laughs> so God bless America. <laughs> That's, um, that, that's very funny. Did not think of that. But people surprise you. <laughs> they, they do. All kinds of things. <laughs> um, so much fun. I just, um, there's a question from the audience just for, and um, on both sides of the aisle, like what resources um, are there, organizations, um, trainings for um, people considering running, for, uh, women considering running for office or folks who are, are hoping to manage a race? Like, um, where can they get resources and help to, to help them win? on either side, I know you have an order. Winning for Women. <laughs> um, yeah, Winning for Women set up, we're a, a super PAC, but then we also have a, a C4 that we can do um, things, you know, for, for general advocacy, and that can include, um, you know, general trainings and things like that, but certainly as far as um, for outside group support, right of center, um, Winning for Women, I'd say, as far as super PACs go. <laughs> um, so obviously on the Democratic side we've got Emily's List, there's just a, such a plethora of organizations supporting women, you know, notably though it takes a lot more asks for a woman to run for office, um, so that, that has to be a little bit of a longer runway, but there's Blue Leadership Collaborative, which is women um, and people of color focused, um, there's Emerge, I feel like I'm going to miss a ton. Um, I'm trying to think of others that I'm... Right. Uh, there are a lot of state um, PACs, too. There are Emily's List at the state level. I also want to say, as a shout-out to Emily's List, a very exciting new leader um, that you Californians know uh, in LaFonza Butler, and I think it's very exciting that she's taking over. Um, and then, um, you know, I think within the Democratic Party, I mean, uh, there are strong, there's still in some states some strong women caucuses. And uh, other folks out in the audience, if we're forgetting someone, um, shout it out because uh, the, on the Democratic side, there are really quite a few resources. And then there's also, um, you know, there was uh, uh, for pro choice women in both parties there were uh, some resources for them as well. Although, sadly, from my point of view, fewer Republican pro-choice women running, but. And Sam, doesn't, I think Tim Scott has um, Future Leaders Fund or something of the sort. He also does some training and whatnot with um, women in diversity. Yeah, it's called uh, Opportunity uh, Matters Fund. And so, yeah, so it's, uh, I mean, there's so many good organizations in uh, DC on the federal level. Um, I think one of the best tools, though, we haven't talked about is the actual incumbents, right? So if yeah. you're like a, a Republican Democrat member of Congress, um, I mean, they're amazing resources um, and they meet with candidates all the time, right? It's, it's very accepted practice in DC if you're a candidate to meet with an incumbent member, whether they're in your state or not. Um, so yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, Congresswoman Stefanik, very active in uh, uh, women recruitment, um, training so yeah i think i think the members are awesome resources you know the other thing that exists and you, i think you said a really good thing shelby about the longer runway there are also organizations that start before you're in the campaign that are really important to get into running start ready to run i'm sure i'm forgetting a ton of really good ones front for higher heights for yeah, african-american awesome. women she should run she should run yeah thank you so and some of them are bipartisan so that that runway the other thing that um, you mentioned that I think was really important, Sam, is um, we do have this problem that women do raise more money from women, and that's a good thing, except that women write smaller checks, so that's a bad thing. Uh, so, and, uh, you know, and I think, Shelby, you must have had this experience. You walk into the finance, and I'd be really interested to know if this is true for Republicans, too. I have walked into so many rooms in the finance committee, and I know Rose has, has pulled out her hair over this, 
And the men will have serious money around the table. They'll have the business leader, they'll, even if they're a Democrat. They'll have the banker. They'll have the golf buddy who's the head of the labor union, whatever. The women, it's like her best friend from college, uh, her next-door neighbor, the PTA mom. And, not, and not, nothing against any of these people, but if there's $10,000 in this room, we're lucky. And so um, this small donor piece has really been game-changing. Uh, for women, and I think a very, very important piece. And there's no way a candidate like AOC would have won without the small donor contributions. Um, one last question. We, we often talk about federal or, or executive level offices, but I know a lot of folks in the audiences are running races up and down the ballot, and really small races. And so is there any specific advice you would, would give in terms of like the more local races, city council, um, you know, um, state assembly, those types of races, are there any differences there or things that they should consider or, or things that are less important than some of the things that we've brought up already? I mean, I think a great pipeline for women candidates is school board. Um, I, women have an advantage on, on those types of races. So school board, superintendent, um, voters are more ready to vote for a woman. Um, I think no matter the party on that. Um, but I think, you know, all of those are stepping stones for if they want to run for higher office, obviously having had run a race before is going to make their next race easier. Um, and I think is a good opportunity for folks that are doing candidate recruitment um, to look at those smaller offices to see who could run for the federal office. Because it's not just building those. I, mean, I think this probably goes without saying, but it's not just building those the support within your geographical area. It's also building the, those donor networks, which is why you know a, a brand new woman candidate and a male candidate coming from the legislature has such an advantage. And it's not just name ID. They also already have a, a short list of donors to tap for max outs and things like that. So it helps you get started on that. You're not starting from scratch when you, when you go for the, a bigger bite, whatever that seat might be. There's a lot more ability in those lower level offices, and you all are the experts on this much more than I am. Shelby, you're a, really an, an unsung national expert on this. Uh, the ability to run grassroots campaigns at these lower level offices, the ability to, not, not in California, which is like trying to win Western Europe, but um, you know, in Montana, where Shelby and I are both from. So good pick on the panel here. Um, the Mo Montana Mafia is strong. Um, you, can, you can go door to door, you can have a canvas. And John Tester, thanks to Shelby and Crystal and, and other uh, people running that campaign, had an extremely good uh, field operation in Canvas. So the ability, the lower the level of the office to run more grassroots and, um, and have also a reinforcement network. Uh, the other thing I would say that we didn't get to but I, I, I want to lift up is uh, starting early to build a social media network, and I think Tim Scott did a brilliant job of this, thanks to you, I'm sure, of, uh, and Kim did a brilliant job of this, to protect against social media, because the social media, I don't care which party you're in, they go after the women with a vengeance, uh, and it's like, for the Democratic women, 10 times as much negative and sexualized and violent contact, for Republican women, twice as much. So establishing early on social media to defend against that, really, really important. Um, and Celinda, uh, we, we just have a few more minutes, so I just want to, and you can say nothing, it's fine, but is there anything that you want to lift up before, you know, one last thing you want to give to the audience about, you know, what is the thing for you, the winning formula for women, what's the one thing that we haven't brought up or you want to, you know, bring back up because you feel like it's so important, so we'll, we'll start. Um, I oh, think ahead, that, um, uh, you know, I, I go back to the beginning, which is, that uh, a lot of women still in both parties are still feel that they are outsiders. And uh, I, um, Barbara Mikulski, uh used to say, people said when she was first elected to the Senate, boy, you're an overnight success. And she said, I'm a 25 year overnight success, where you been? And the fact that, um, you know, uh, I, I think it's really exciting to have a panel like this, even if it is at eight o'clock in the morning, um, and to have such really experienced consultants. Uh, but a lot of the things are the same but I think women always still run a little bit as the outsider. Sam, any last thoughts, parting gifts? 
Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. I think um, politics in many ways is still like the old boys club, right? So like um, I always encourage uh, women candidates not only um, be authentic, but I mean, show some fire in the belly, right? Because I think that is a, that, that's a huge thing that um, I think not only is it like attractive to stakeholders, donors, you know, uh, voters, but um, you know, I think that's what people want to see right now. So like I, I, I actually remember uh, being in a meeting with uh, a, a candidate in 2019, uh, uh, she was uh, looking to run for uh, Congress, um, I ended up not doing so, but someone that uh, Michael knows as well, and she was like, I just got in trouble because I dropped an F-bomb in a meeting. I'm like, well, I mean, if, if, uh, if you're inclined to do so, just do it, who cares, right? It's like, just go for it, like, show people, show some fire in the belly, it's fine. Uh, that's who you are, and, and I thought that was like something that would actually work in her favor because she, um, she's a total badass, right? So like, I was like, hey, you want to show people that side of you. So I was like, hey, like, you know, don't shy away from who you really are. Like, you know, in, in politics, that, that will kind of work in your favor nowadays, so. Yeah, um, I think that really important for both candidates and campaign managers and, and women political staff would be to just build out your network. Um, Sam touched on this, but you know the Democratic Women's Caucus for for members of Congress is is hugely helpful and an important um, tool and resource for for federal candidates. Um, but I think there's like a lot of opportunities to sort of just build out um, your network either in state or nationally. Um, this would be a good opportunity to do that too. Um, but then I think the other thing is um, you know women are not men you cannot use the the man playbook um and so i think there's like other just when you think about running a campaign that's authentic to them i think you just also have to be cognizant um you know there's like things to do to set them up for success like you might put a man in a pickup truck without a mic to speak to a big audience like that might not be a good idea for a woman and just always making sure you're framing it up to put them in their best light to tee them up for success, um, I think as staff is, is really important. And then um, piggyback on what Sam said earlier about small dollar, I think a particularly right of center, it, um, building out your, your small dollar fundraising is so important for women candidates. I think even in the, we saw even in some of the redder states for women who had never run before, didn't have, um, an infrastructure of, of major donors from time in the state legislature or something of the sort um, were able to raise money from across the country in small dollars and, and make it through their primaries. And it has the added benefit, you know, back in, I think, 17 or so, we, we did some polling among the Republican electorate just asking them what they knew about high-profile women in elected office and all of the names they knew partly just by quantity but just by profile and platform were Democratic women. So when folks were thinking of a woman running, their profile did not fit where that Republican primary electorate was going to be voting anyway. And I think the small dollar fundraising is helping with that a lot more because it is, it is building the profiles of these women across the country. And we're seeing that change. We're seeing them have, have a lot bigger profiles nationwide. So that's, that would be mine. Great, thank you. I would really want to thank the folks on the panel. You were awesome and it, it was great. I, I learned a, quite a bit, so it was a fun listening. I hope y'all got a lot out of it. And again, thank you for getting up at 8 a.m. to join us. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Larry right, thank you. Breakout sessions start at 9.30, so thank y'all. Thank you so much. Yes. You did a great job, Larry.